Any questions from the floor? Yeah, at the back. My view would be that it has to. Yeah. Uh, a barrage was such a sort of beacon of the private equity industry within the region that for those international investors, their credit committees are going to ask, as they always do, where are you putting the funds and why? And now whenever the Middle East comes up, there will be additional questions and everyone is going to have to justify that investment uh, under far more scrutiny. So it will take longer to get some of the funds and they'll probably be less allocated to it for a period of time. I think in the longer term, this is still a region where there's tremendous growth, tremendous opportunities, and they will come back. But there will be a short six to maybe 18 month time where it is harder to raise those funds or you're not getting as much of a commitment from the LPs that you thought. I'd also say some of the LPs that are in the Abraj case specifically will, will be very reticent to put money into existing funds without further scrutiny of them. What it probably also means for the local PE funds will be they will need to be far more transparent around you know, numbers reporting, you know, transparency in terms of information, but particularly their controls and how cash is being used. And so they're going to probably have to ramp up their internal compliance functions significantly to be able to deal with some of these issues that are coming out. Well, I definitely agree with the transparency point. Um, but typically, when you, you look at what happened, the, the Quaid fund was really a pensions fund. Everybody really, you really put that down without thinking about it later on and expect that it's going to be invested in a proper fashion. And once you see a statement coming back to say that it's increased, it, you, you're not really contemplating you know, the performance of the fund, so to speak, from, from, from one side. But now I think it's going to bring forward a lot of that in, in terms of how people live invest how institutions look at funds from, from whatever jurisdiction. So yes, I think there's going to be a significant impact on, on, on how, how investments go forward. I think it diminishes the, the, the value yeah. of the, the regulator. Um, I think, in fact, I've, I've seen with most of the clients that have come asking for, for a fund to be set up, uh, they, they want to be able to pitch that to, to investors to say, we are regulated, that there is you know, some sort of regulatory arbitrage that they have to go through in order to move forward. The downfall is that the regulatory process moves a little slower, um, and so even in this case with, with SEMA maybe sitting in the sidelines and people are wondering why the regulator isn't stepping up to intervene in the middle of it, it's, it's mostly because just, just like with the courts, you know, it, it has to be beyond a reasonable doubt for them before they, they make a move. But in the same interim, what, what gives some, uh, some sort of confidence to the fact that it is a regulated fund is, is the fact that it will have to do prudential reporting. It will have to have a, a manager that, that, that has certain fitness and propriety standards that has to be met. And so to, to that extent, I think it, it, it still would, would be a better option. I mean, to answer your question in terms of market perception, I think, and that's what you were getting at, I think it's an unfair question to ask because, I mean, for what happens in US and UK, we don't sit around and say, oh, by the way, the FSA is not doing its job properly or SEC is not doing its job properly. We don't question the ability of the regulator because we recognize, in those jurisdictions at least, that there will always be bad players. The players who are going to act not in accordance with what's happening in the market and they are going to get caught. And I think and that's what needs to be remembered, that this jurist, just because there is a bad player in the market, and this is assuming abroad is a bad player, right? Because right now we are just going on the basis of allegation. That not, does not make what the regulator is doing, what his requirements are, or what his job is incorrect. And I think these are the questions we only ask of these jurisdictions, but we would never ask of a sophisticated jurisdiction. And I think that's, in that sense, it's a very unfair question to ask of the regulator. Do you think it's a 
I don't think it's a challenge because we haven't gotten to a point where it's been tested. And uh, so, and I think and that's, that's the problem, the uncertainty of unknown, and that's why we kind of blame the regulator or the player or the individual. But, and that's what I'm getting at, let it work out. I mean, and let it work out hopefully consensually rather than through court system. Uh, but, my, yeah. my personal view, I think there's big questions to the regulator yeah. within Dubai, the yeah. DFSA, and that's not to say that it, it itself has been lacking. Correct. But I think you know, for Dubai as a whole to set itself up as the place to invest to set these things up, one of the big selling points is the regulatory regime and the court system. And unfortunately for the DFSA, this is the first one which really fits yes. into that. Correct. Now, the challenge for the DFSA, I would imagine, is that I bet it's pretty difficult to get involved for the reasons that you're saying, but also you know, because you know, the funds are set up in the Cayman and other places as well, where do their responsibilities lie? And that's really difficult to then communicate to the public that's expecting to see the DFSA take action or at least be more visible. And certainly what I would like to see from the DFSA is just more communication around this issue to demonstrate that they are on top of it and that they are clearly communicating what they can do and what they can't do. So I think at the moment, you don't really hear from the DFSA. Um, there's some sort of inferences that they were the ones that may have been involved in getting Deloitte engaged from a, a wider forensic review, but they're not sort of standing up and saying, look, we are a player, notwithstanding the, the technicalities, this is an issue for the DFSA to be aware of and to be dealing with, and this is what we're doing. And this is what we're allowed to be doing. And I says that communication element, I think, is needed. Which I think well, that that's a double-edged sword, though, it for is, a regulator, it isn't is, it? <laughs> it is for a regulator. As an ex-regulator, yeah, yeah. um, the, the, rather than suggesting that the confidence should come out by the fact that they're being transparent about what they're doing, yeah. I, I think most regulators like to work behind the scenes. Right. And, and as I say, a lot of it is an information gathering exercise to begin with. Because behind the scenes, as you're saying, they, there's a supervisory section separate from an enforcement section. And the supervisory section is the one that's going to be saying, okay, let me see exactly what you have, what it is that you have been missing in terms of meeting my regulatory standards, and then pass it over to the enforcement side to say, this is perhaps our best way of, of, of handling it. But at the end of the day, too, they're looking at are investors being prejudiced? Are investors completely uh, at a loss in terms of where their, their investment stands? Is the full substratum of the company or fund gone? What, what are the key things that, that needs to be looked at? And then, and then too, you may not see it now, but then later on you may, you may not know, but that particular director may never be able to sit up as a director again, you know, it, the company itself may be struck off and you do not understand that came from the regulatory end. Um, theirs is not about publicity, it's never been with, with the regulator. It's, it's, and again, because too, there isn't the appetite to show that they get in the middle of a commercial dispute unless it raises high reputational damage for the jurisdiction or um, definitely is a situation where they can't see either side coming to an arrangement and have to step in. That's where then I would say I think there is a high reputational issue. And in my personal view would be so the other jurisdictions you're talking about, they've earned the credibility over a long period of time True. because the markets have been there for longer and they've, they've had the time to develop. You know, with a region like Dubai, which is trying to do in a very short amount of time what others have done over a very long period of time, you can't, apply this, you, you can't apply the same processes for dealing with some of these situations because actually you need to keep those funds here. Let's call them investment funds in the DIFC and under the DFSA's regulation. And therefore, to gain the investor's confidence and prevent sort of loss of confidence, you need to be more active to say what you are doing about it. And it may just be what you are doing in the background, but it's just being a bit, my view would be it's being a bit more open about it to give those other investors trust that something is happening. Rather than looking at it, and I mean, well, mind you, I'm doing? not a regulator anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but I, I can, I can see where you're coming from yeah. with, with, with that. But um, and then as I'm saying, my experience has been in with Cayman. That was a big push in, in time when a number of these cases started coming up, which was to be you're, you're seeing more by going to actual investor meetings. You know, going um, to the court, and even if you're not saying anything, sitting there, so they recognize that that 
there is an interest in, in what is going on. Um, behind the scenes, requests for disclosure of information, putting in people like PwC and others yourselves to, to ensure that somebody independent is, is, is taking an, an, a holistic look I mean, at, at the picture. The thing that I want to say as a regulatory lawyer is that when, when you're looking at these cases from a regulatory perspective, it's not just one stakeholder that you need to look at. I mean, yes, we are all looking at it from an investor perspective, but for the regulator perspective, it's also important what happens to the bank itself, or the financial institution, what it happens. Yeah. And the regulator can't be seen to just put pretty much the, the institution under the bus to protect investor application. Yeah. So it has to act as a neutral party. And yes, for the growth of the economy, it might be important that investor perspective is safe, but if it turns out that the regulator acted in a manner which was prejudicial, to the company for the benefit of just few individuals, a bigger investor, because let's be honest, it's going to be the bigger investor and creditors that's going to be looked out at that manner, that that is a problematic situation as well from a regulatory perspective. Because in the long run, you're losing at that point other financial institutions actually using your regulatory system because if you're looked at as a protective environment where it's going to protect the interest of one party to the other. So they have to in many ways, be cautious as to what they're doing. And yeah. I think, I mean, those are all, so there has to be a balance from that perspective. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with that. Um, but if you, if you look at even with, with MF Global, they looked at the failures of the, the non-executive directors. Correct. Correct. I mean, there, there are other precedents from Cayman where there was an entire judgment that just simply went at looking at exactly what was the management style of the of the director and whether there was potential liabilities of the directors and managers themselves so in stepping back you know they're looking at at, at all sides of it when when it comes to the, the the matter itself is my view yeah I think that's a really long answer to your yeah. question <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they accepted. They, so they accepted the fact that they're not going to be able to pay a loan, and the way uh, the, uh, the the way most of the civil codes are work, worked out, if you accept the fact that you're not able to pay the loan, then you mm -hmm. are considered in default, and it's a technical issue. Even though if you don't pay it, if you accept your non-payment ability to pay, that can result in a default, and that's that's what yeah. they've done. They haven't actually the payment well, date hadn't arrived. What about the well, others? Uh, actually, um, my understanding with it as well was once they've made that that particular statutory demand yeah. and put a date to it, once that date has passed, and I think they put the the third of June was yeah, the date they put on it. Right. So for, um, the minute the date passed, then they can just simply say to the court, "There's doubtful solvency." Yeah, with, but with regards I mean, to, but the, to, the to it. They filed before the 3rd of June. They and, did. And, that, and the reason for that is what the law allows. Law says that if you accept your inability to pay, yeah. then you are in default. Yeah. And this would trigger any other... Of course it will. Other. I'm sure it will trigger yes. cross default. Of course it will trigger cross default depending on what is in the terms of... A, yeah. yeah. So it is a so depending on what it's in the other agreements, and I think everybody should be looking at their credit agreements. They should be looking at their investor agreements. They should to see what's happening. What are, I mean, sometimes there might be thresholds which might not be triggered, but yeah, everybody should be looking at that. Mm -hmm. Some in some instances there there is even non petition clauses yeah. that that are within the articles or or, the, or their particular uh, subscription agreement. So that has to be looked at first as to whether that can be challenged. 